All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Michael, Laura, and Krista here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and welcome to session three of Big Talk from Small Libraries 2014. Uh, we're going to switch gears here a little bit, and this session is entitled You Can Q, Using Q Method to Understand Community Needs for Small Libraries. This is presented by Mary Jordan, the, uh, an assistant professor at Simmons College, GSLIS program. Prior to ac entering academia, she worked in a small public library as a director and administrator. Her research and consulting work now focuses on ways to help libraries to function better and serve their communities more effectively. Uh, Mary, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. And I've definitely been enjoying the conference so far. So. Um, as I said, that I am a former small public library person, so I'm kind of familiar with some of the needs and the problems that small public libraries had. And I know one of the issues that I constantly had was need to try to evaluate um, all of my services and evaluate what we were doing and try and find out what my community wanted, but I didn't have, well, the time, and I didn't have the expertise to make all of this happen. So I came into the, um, I came into the idea of Q method and into the idea of academia in general as a way to sort of understand what I was doing here um, and how I could work with my libraries better. So when you're thinking about Q method, um, it's a, just a strategy, it's just a tool that you could use to do those things, to help evaluate your services, to help find out what's going on in your community, and to help sort of reach out to people. Um, I'm going to let, if people want to jump in with questions, um, I think the organizers might be able to read them to me, and I'm going to save time at the end for more questions. But uh, just thinking about yourselves, and I'm sort of imagining you all right now, I don't know how many of you have tried to give out surveys in your library. Hands raised. Yes, I see you there. Good. And they work sometimes, but I was always really frustrated with surveys because you ask those questions of, well, tell me on a scale of one to five, how do you like our circulation? Or how do you like how quickly ILLs come in? And everybody always said either five, they loved everything, everything was great, everything was wonderful, which of course I love to hear, but that's not necessarily helpful. Or they would say things like, well, uh, we're, we're, we're angry about today, and so we don't like anything. That's also not terribly helpful. So what Q method does is, in fancy statistical language, um, it lets you blend sort of qualitative and quantitative ideas, and it lets you come out with some really impressive statistical ideas. But it's honestly, it's really easy. <laughs> and it's really fun for your patrons to do. It's something a little bit different, and it's something that's going to um, encourage people to want to share their ideas with you, which is always an issue. But knowing that this is a nice, reliable, valid statistical methodology, it gives you lots of really fancy data and cool numbers and things, and that's something you can always share with your funders, with your people in your community, and just it lets everybody know you know what you're doing, you're asking for things, for more money for some program, or you're asking for assistance in bringing in some other kind of equipment because you very clearly know that this is what your community members want. So I'm going to start off just by looking at um, what you get at the end of a Q method, which is groupings of your respondents, which I'm just going to say patrons, because I'm going to assume that most of my Q studies have been on library patrons, and that's probably what yours will be too. So, and I felt like this was a, this was probably a topic we could all kind of relate to. Uh, we're not academic librarians, but we probably all know a little something about stress in libraries. Um, so, when I talked to and sent out Q methods to um, academic libraries from around the country, they came up. What I ended up with was uh, three different groupings of people who uh, were stressed out by different things in their workplace. So the first one is probably something many of us can relate to. It's just all these people. Everything that's constantly going on. It's their family they have issues with their, their home life, um, they, that are bleeding over into work life. They have issues with the people who are coming in. They have issues that they don't have enough personal space. Um, they have issues with the students they have to work with. It's just, it's a lot. And it, this group of people, these are the things that we discovered they were most stressed out about. Knowing this, means then that you as 
you know, an, an administrator as a manager, you as a team member who's working to help solve this problem in your library, you could take these answers and help build a program to design for these people. So the next group of people, um, the, the next group of people who had uh, stressors, the things that they were stressed out was kind of all the stuff that was happening at work. So that they had a lot of interruptions, that their schedule shifted around a lot, they had all these different deadlines to meet, and that's what was stressing them out. It wasn't the people, it was kind of the administrative side of things. And so again, now we know libraries could take specific steps to solve that. And then our third group of people, just, uh, my heart broke a little here, but this is the people who were just stressed out about everything. Everything is upsetting them. People are upsetting them. The administrative stuff is upsetting them. The technology is upsetting It's just everything is hard for these folks. And knowing that you have people in your organization who had this level of stress might lead you to uh, more to larger steps that you could take to try and help them out. So, you know, whether you refer them to an EAP or something else, now you know. So now I'm not anticipating that you're going to necessarily look within your library to see what you guys are stressed out about, although it's certainly a good study and uh, I advocate it for everyone. Um, I have other public library studies that I've done that show different kinds of stressors um, and I'd be happy to talk with you later about that. But what I want to do now is now you sort of see how things are grouped in the end. So we go through a Q study, come up with these nice little groupings. So now I want to kind of walk through the process of how do we set up a Q study? What, what happens in Q? Because again, if I ask sort of for a show of hands and everybody sitting at your desk or in your living room, if everybody raises their hand who's heard of Q methodology, no, no, yeah, I see a distinct lack of hands up in the air right now. Uh, this is not surprising because I, I have this all the time because I talk about Q methodology a lot when I go places. I talk about it with my students and, and pretty much it's, it's, it's an unfamiliar process, but I do think it's something, it's easy, it's fun. We can do this as people who are small public librarians. So why would you? And when your board asks you, you have all of these things to do. You are you have to do you know you have to do your programming. You have to do reference. You have to check books out. You have to bring new stuff in. You have to keep the doors open. Why would you be trying to add more onto your plate? Well, it's because it's always important for us to try and figure out what people need and what people want. And it will be super if what our communities needed and wanted stayed the same and it never changed and from day to day and year to year, it was always the same. We would know how to help them then and that would be, that'd be great. Um, I don't know if you're in a community like that, but I, I've never been. So let's just assume that probably you're not either and that um, understanding your patrons and understanding your community, which includes people who don't come to your library, uh, is going to be important in trying to make sure that you stay relevant to their lives and that you stay relevant um, and important in your role as public librarian. So the time that you take to set aside for evaluation, um, it's, it should pay off for you. So first of all, you want to figure out what your evaluation need is. So um, at after we walk through this process, I'm going to show you a study that I'm uh, that I have finished uh, looking at public libraries across the state of Illinois, and then talk a little bit about a public a study that I'm starting that might be relevant to you. But in my study that I was looking at in Illinois, what we wanted to know was what what do people want? What do people in the community want from their public libraries? So it might be things that they don't know we have. It might be things that they definitely know we have, but they're just not there. Maybe they're using them and they love them, or they we they know we have them, but they don't care. So that's your evaluation need, and yours could be different, and this could literally be anything. So it could be looking at your your staff to see how stressed they are. Uh, you could be looking at you know community needs. You could be looking at specific groups of people. Um, so let's say you're interested in recruiting more seniors into your library. So that would be your evaluation need, um, or you want to bring in more five-year-olds to your library because they're always fun, um, and so. Bring in your five-year-olds would be would be your evaluation need. It can be anything. 
anything relevant to you. So then the next step that I have on here is to develop a, a set of ideas that are relevant to your topic. So with the Q method, you print out a little set of cards and each card has an idea. So you have one idea on each card. Um, and then people will sort them in order um, from their most to least. But all you have to do first is come up with your ideas. This can be kind of tricky. So you and your staff, your community, you know, trusted patrons, a board member, more board members, um, people that would have an interest in your topic, ask them what kinds of things they think you might want to put in. You want to try and hold it. It can go to about 60 and still be valid. But think for yourself, if somebody handed you a set of 60 different cards and told you to sort them in order from 1 to 60, thing you like most, a thing you like least, uh, it, it's tough. <laughs> so I try to hold it down to like 25 or 30 usually. Um, and you can go fewer than that if you'd like to. So just come up with your ideas that are relevant and good. And then find some people. So now in my study in Illinois, my people that we were recruiting was literally anyone. Um, I was looking just at people who were 18 and over, but that was essentially my only criteria. They didn't have to be library users, they didn't have to love the library, um, nothing. They just had to be in the community and over the age of 18. But now again, think about um, when I mentioned the study on senior citizens. If you want to look at the services that you're offering for seniors, then obviously you've defined yourself into a senior citizen uh, category. And so, however you and your library want to define senior citizens um, is, is, is good. So figure out who you want and then bring some people in. Uh, it's not really difficult to do. You could take this out on the road if you want to. I've done this in a few diners. Um, I've done this in uh, people's offices. <laughs> it's very simple. You just have to have a little space to sort some cards. And then your final step in getting ready is just to print out your cards and then worksheets. I'm going to show you what a worksheet looks like in the next slide. The cards are so easy um, because I don't have a lot of big technical skills either. Um, so all you do is go to your go to the store and the business cards that you can get that you print yourself. That's what I use. So print those out, and on the front side, each card has an idea, and on the back side, put a number. So a number from one to twenty-five. On your worksheet, then you're going to give a place for people to record their answers, uh, but you also want to collect a few demographic questions. Now this is where when I'm talking about this in class, my students start to freeze up a little bit and say, oh, demographics, I don't know, that's starting to sound like a hard word. It's not. No worries here. All it is is you kind of want to have an idea of who you're talking to, particularly if, like my Illinois study, that was anybody, anybody over the age of 18. Um, but I wanted to know kind of what their age ranges were. So how many people are coming in who are, you know, 40 to 50, um, and then 51 to 60? Uh, how many people are coming in who regularly use the library? You can ask them, you know, when was the last time you, used, you were in the library? Last week, uh, last month, in the last year, uh, in the last five years? Do you have a library card? If you have a gender identification? Um, some things that you're going to want to look at will, will you'll want to know about people who are interested in different kinds of languages or different kinds of services in your library that might be relevant to people who speak different languages at home. So that would be good then to ask, so what language do you speak at home? All you want to do when you're thinking of demographics is just figure out who it is that you're who it is that, that's answering your questions. Um, you don't have to collect their name. That's not relevant. It's not useful. Um, so it's not, it's not personal. It's not personally identifiable information. Just stuff that will help you to identify who you have so you can make your results better for everybody. So this is, sorry, a little bit blurred. Now this is kind of the ideal of what a Q-sort process looks like. So you could make something like this and print this out and people could lay their cards down in all these different little areas. Um, now I will tell you, I don't know if this makes me a bad Q study researcher, but uh, I have never actually used one of these because it looks kind of, it looks to me a little bit complicated. It requires a little bit more explanation. So I just make I just print out a word sheet and just have the numbers 1 through 25 printed out on there. 
Um, and then I just tell people to just sort them and just lay them in a big line on their table uh, or on the desk in front of us. And then they flip each card over and I have a number on the back of the card. So let's say whatever idea number nine was, um, that, that's what they think is absolutely the most important thing to have in the library. So in the number one spot on the worksheet, they write their answer is number nine. I don't think it matters so much how you do it, just as long as you make sure that, they're, that the answers are getting recorded in the order from stuff we like most to stuff we like least. So this is how you actually do it. All right, now we've prepped, we've looked at worksheet development. So this is how you actually do a Q study. This is your data collection. So you have your person who comes in. You might have a few people at the same time. It's fine. It, it either way works. You give each person who comes in a set of cards. So they have a whole set of your cards, 1 through 25. And each card, again, has an idea on the front, a number on the back. And they get a set and they get a worksheet. So you just you explain to them a little bit, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking, I'm interested in finding out you know, what programs are most relevant to five-year-olds. So could you, or to parents of five-year-olds, that might be easier, uh, do you go through and rank these you know, from the thing that you like most to the thing that you like least? Now this is where some reassurance comes in because I've had people kind of uh, freak out a little bit here. And, it, they really, they're so concerned about making it right, making sure that uh, it's exactly right, that it's really, they really want to make sure that it's good. It's okay. All they need to do is just sort. So they can start off by maybe putting things into three piles. So they have a pile of ideas that they know, yeah, definitely, these, these, these are awesome, I need these. And they have a pile of, ugh, no, this is just not of any interest to me. And they have a pile of, I don't know, maybe. And then within those piles, they can start to sort things out. I always try to tell people, too, that what they would put down as card number one, card number two, yeah, that's probably not wildly different. And that's OK. It doesn't have to be. So don't worry too much about specific placement. Those numbers will be very, those what you sort there, what you have interest in very, very most, will be very different than a card that you would sort like into the tenth spot. And it's probably very, very different. It's definitely very, very different than a card that you would sort into like spot number 20. So don't worry so much about just strict perfection within the, you know, within your number of cards, but get it close. Get in, get in the ballpark, and that's, that's going to be fine. Now, they don't have to absolutely love everything that you're giving to them. Maybe you want to find out what sort of programming would be good in your library, and so you have, you've given people 15 different potential programs that you could offer to see what they, what they are interested in. And somebody comes to you and says, ah, these are all just yucky. I don't like any of these, blah. Well, what do you least hate could be number one, and <laughs> what do you most hate then would be number 15. Uh, or, and this is a little more typical, people say, ah, I love all of these. I would love to have all of these come in. Well, now this is where a Q method is, I think, really superior to those Likert scales on a survey. They can't say everything is exactly the same. So maybe they discover that the technology petting zoo is pretty close to the baby goat petting zoo program that you want to bring in. And you know, now that they're thinking about it, yeah, maybe the square dancing program is down at the bottom. It's still good. They still love to do it. Square dancing in the library would be awesome, but it's not, it's not as good for them as the baby goat petting zoo and the technology petting zoo. So I've had a few people who just really take a while. It's OK. Just, just kind of, I always say in sort of a metaphorical way, a pat pat. You're fine. Everybody's good. Just keep going. So you have them sort their cards in the order until they're happy with it. And they say, yes, I'm happy. This, this is it. And then they just flip the cards over. And there's an, each, each idea has been given a number. They put those numbers in order onto their worksheet. And it's pretty simple. So sometimes people 
they'll finish it all up and they'll hand it to them, they'll, then they're excited. Well, now what happens? Now what do you do? Or tell me what you were really trying to get at. <laughs> I, I always try to reassure people, this, there, there was nothing excitingly hidden here. It really was just the idea of, um, it really was just that I wanted to know what sort of programs you're interested in, or I want to know what sort of stress you're having. That's all. Um, so you can, if people are interested, you can offer to, uh, you know, make up a report that you could share then with your community, include in your newsletter, put up on your website, something like that, just so people understand where you, where you went with the results that they gave to you. All right. And we have a huge pile of data in our hands. And by huge pile of data, I mean you probably have, I don't know, 30 worksheets in your hands. 30 people came in. Hooray. Success. So because this is fancy and statistical and all, you go to the fun computer program. Now the one that I have been using is called PQ Method. And I'm going to give you a site at the end for where this is found, but I can just tell you now the website is called qmethod.org. No spaces or dashes or anything, just the letter Q, method.org. So they have software on there that they have built. It's a little clunky, and by a little clunky, I mean there might be tears, but it, it works out eventually. And I'll show you at the end again, I'm going to show you materials that you can use to set up your own Q studies, and it'll walk you through it. So this is the one I've been using because it's free and because I'm, although I've occasionally had a few tears over it, I'm familiar with it and I, I get it, it works. So it's fine. There are other new programs though that are out as Q method becomes a bigger methodology. Uh, more people are interested in it and so they're building um, other software that'll do this. So Q method has actually been around for quite a while. It's been around since the early 1900s. Uh, William Stevenson, a professor at University of Chicago in psychology, was the one who developed this. And it's, so it's been there for a while, but really one of the things that's always held, the, held it back, or held it back for many years, was it's an amazing amount of work to put together. And so we had to really wait to get popular until computers could start doing all of this for us. So there, we're getting better too. People are building better and better programs. But when I say, okay, you type in all your data, there you go, and then magic happens. I am technically a researcher and scholar and all those good things, but uh, I don't really understand how, how all of the statistics works. It is essentially a factor analysis comparing the position of every single answer that every single person gives to the positioning of every other answer that every single other person gave. I shorthand that is it's magic. Uh, so, but it works out. It it just it, they give you like 50 sheets of data, 50 pages of data at the end, and it's very cool. It's very exciting, and you look at it like I have stuff. I really have something here. And again, it's something that you can really show to your funders and you show your board and you say, look, see how see how worth it this was? This is data we can rely on. This is good data. This was, this was worth the time and the occasional tear. Um, it's good. So at, in, in all of these 50 pages of data, you'll start, you'll see groupings of people. And it's these groupings that are kind of the, the interesting part. So they'll tell you, well, people who, as we looked at with the stress study, first of all here, uh, everybody who chose these five things as this was the most important thing to them. This is, this is the most, this is the big thing. This is what definitely affects their life, that they're in a group. And you, you'll also find the people in that group, the things that they didn't like, the things that were not interesting to them, the things that were not important to them. Um, all of, all of that will go into defining a group. So when you finish this, you might say, oh, well, these are probably things that I knew about my patrons. I don't anticipate most of you, when you do Q studies, will have enormous surprises because you know your patrons. I mean, you know the people who come in and especially, or even when you're looking at studies that are that you're looking at outside of your patrons, you know, you're looking at people in the community who don't use the library, I mean, you still probably know them. I mean, I, I have spent most of my lives in small communities, and even if we're not on first name basis, I kind of have a gist of other people. So you're not going to find tremendously surprising things necessarily, although you might find some, um, some groupings that surprise you or some groupings that you hadn't necessarily thought of in this way. 
So it'll help you to understand what it is that people want from you, what it is that people like, what it is that is making people uh, happy in their different um, ways that they're relating to your library. So I got started um, in Q method. I had done a couple of small studies, but I did this large study in Illinois. And um, if anybody is out there from an Illinois Public Library and they have stopped off in your library a few years ago, uh, and it was this was a really interesting and for me very fun project. So the former Lewis and Clark Library System in Illinois, which sadly is is no more, but they, the director there, and then a couple of their uh, staff were really interested in trying to figure out what what do we want, what we're thinking about the future. We're planning for the future. We have things kind of ready to go, but what what do our people what do our the, are the people that our libraries serve what do they actually want? We don't want to just guess because that we can make mistakes and we could really you know we can guess and decide everyone wants Kindles and you're an iPad community. Everyone uses apples. Uh, no one will touch your Kindle. I mean you've just wasted a whole lot of money and a whole lot of time. Um, so that's what we wanted to avoid. We also wanted to give people, as libraries were starting to think about strategic plans and several of their libraries in this system, and I, across the state too, I think, but it, specifically in the system, we're thinking about their, um, their strategic plans. And so we wanted, they wanted as a system to be able to provide uh, some guidance to the libraries. As you're planning for your for your future, as you're writing your strategic plan for the next, you know, three years, five years, um, what what should we be? What should you be putting in? What should you be sort of aiming yourself toward? Even knowing you're not there this year, you're not there next year, but five years down the road, where do we want to be? So we wanted to ask people. <laughs> it seems so simple now, doesn't it? In retrospect, but it, it actually took a while to get to that. So I traveled around the state and um, stopped into some libraries, um, and the libraries helped me find uh, people in their community, and it was just, for me, it was a fantastic experience. Um, and we found three groupings of library users. Now again, I doubt any of these are going to be amazingly shocking to you. But it was still, it was useful to have this kind of information. It was useful to be able to sort of boil it all down to just these three groups that we were really looking at. Um, so these were libraries that were small rural libraries, but also uh, some of the larger, we didn't go to Chicago Public, but we did go to some of the large libraries outside of Chicago. Um, so it was a real cross section. Um, and that, I think, I mean, that gave us answers that were good kind of an above view of Illinois, but I'm going to talk later about my study coming up where I'm trying to make this a little finer. So uh, completely unsurprisingly, this was the first group that came up. And it wasn't necessarily the most populated, the largest group, but it was the first one that popped up in the data. And certainly no one, no one was stunned by this. It's people who are just happy. They just like the library. They come in. Um, they have books, they have magazines, uh, some of them said they like the coffee, that's fun, um, and that's it, they're happy, they're, they're not really interested in more, although several, and these, these library people, library users, tended to skew toward the older age ranges, um, and they said though, and several of them were saying to me, I know things like email and Facebook and all that are out there. That was that was something that they could choose. I'm not interested in it, but I know my neighbors are. I know my grandkids are. So we wanted them to just focus on them specifically. What are you interested in? So it was interesting. I think several people in this group said, I know it's not for me, but um, thinking about it, you might include it. So then our next group was information innovation. Um, oh, and a question that I often get is, where do these names come from? Uh, we thought of these names. <laughs> so you get to name your group uh, whatever you think is going to be descriptive. And if you want to name it a fun name, go ahead and do that. But that, that does not come up in your statistic data. That, that comes from you. So we call this second group uh, the information innovation group. So these were people who wanted new things. 
they liked they liked the books, they liked the computers, they liked the programs that were there, but what else could we do? What, what was new? What was exciting? So we had several different programs that were um, in this list of choices that people could use, and these people tended to go for all of those. They tended to go for everything that, that was technology. So this group, um, one of the things that they were interested in was potentially seeing podcasts recorded in the library. That would be fun for them. You guys, of course, are already on board here because you've got the webinar, um, and I know the State Library of Nebraska has been very uh, popular, very innovative in doing a lot of this kind of online training, other places have. So you probably um, are already familiar with the idea of this kind of innovation, but patrons are saying they want that too. So this might be something that you want then to bring it back to your library. They also wanted to, things that they were interested in is not just the technology, but being able to focus it in on themselves and being able to kind of bring things the way they wanted it. So less group instruction and more individual, uh, more instruction that they could do on their own outside of the library. Uh, it was, they were, they liked stuff that we did and they wanted to make it theirs. So this third group, uh, we were a little surprised to see this, although now again this has been a few years since the study was done and I'm less surprised now that this is up. But this was one of the first studies that I had seen showing that people come to the libraries and they're not there for the books and they're not there for the computers, um, but they are there just for the, the stuff. So they're there for the cultural programming, they're there for art lessons, uh, they're there to work on, um, we didn't have maker spaces and 3D printers when this study was done several years ago, but increasingly now that's something that you might extrapolate from this. So they're there to do fun things. Now this doesn't mean wildly expensive things. Um, I would be really excited if I could get a 3D printer to put in my office office. I would love that, uh, but I, I don't have the funds for that. Um, a lot of small libraries don't have the funds for things like that right now, although you, know, you guys might be considering doing more expensive things sort of as, a, as, as library systems or joining with other libraries. But people who are interested in the service library programming, um, they were also actually interested in the library like providing um, classes, <clears throat> excuse me, classes for them and things. Um, a couple of people this wasn't part of our study, but a couple of people mentioned that they liked to come to the library and knit, and that they would have liked it if the library had had like a little knitting group. I mean, that's something that would be easy, and I know I've seen libraries who do that. So something like that might be what you want to bring into your library and to make sure that you are, you're kind of reaching out to the people who are there for that idea of the library as the third space, your first space is your home where you spend a lot of time, your second space is your work where you spend too much time, and then your third space is where you're going for fun. And um, I, I don't know if you've read the book or seen the book called Bowling Alone. Uh, I do not remember the author off the top of my head, but Bowling Alone, you guys are librarians, you can find it. Uh, and he talked about this several years ago, about the idea that you know, people used to go down and hang out at the bar uh, on the corner, or people used to join bowling leagues. and there's less of that now because we have different ways to communicate and different ways to be, but people still want that personal connection. And a library can be a place to provide that kind of personal connection. So where is all of this going then? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm interested now in taking that study and the, the knowledge that I got from that and trying to focus it a little bit more. So what I'd like to be doing, and I'm, I'm beginning the process of this now, so um, if you're a library that I may have already contacted looking for um, help and support on this, uh, thank you. And uh, if you're not, I may still get to you. I'm just, just beginning this right now. But what I want to do is look at um, similar kinds of ideas to what was in this study but look specifically at the large urban libraries. What do people want from them? And then very specifically step away from that and look at small libraries, look at rural libraries. And the, they, I think these two populations are going to have very different um, patron needs, but I do actually anticipate overall 
people pretty much want the same things from libraries. So I want to see what the specific differences are, what kind of differences in abilities to provide things, what kind of differences in what our patrons want, what they will be, but I am interested too in just what makes us, we're all public libraries and what makes us all public libraries. So it's building on this study but trying to expand it. So I'm starting the recruiting process now for libraries in each one of these categories. Um, and if you're interested in participating, this could be a way for you to sort of start off with a Q study because I'll be doing the Q study. Um, and um, then you could just, you'll see how, it, how it's done. You could sort of adapt it for yourself and do other Q studies um, in your library. You'll have it forever. Um, it's always for you. And if you're not interested, obviously, that's fine too. Uh, the, right now, I'm just, uh, at the, again, at the beginning kind of stages of thinking about things and putting ideas together. So I've been talking to librarians um, in both large libraries and then in small libraries and trying to get a sense of what are the things that they do that they think are most important. So this slide right here is about 45 <laughs> items. Uh, I, this isn't, this isn't the end. Uh, this is just, I'm probably going to add some more to this and then start trying to refine this down a little bit and trying to make sure that I'm not asking people so many things that it starts to be confusing for them or it starts to, uh, it starts to be, lack a lot of meaning. So the groups that we get are sort of mushy. I don't want that. I want it to be good. I want this to be something useful. So what I did with the uh, study in Illinois is each community that we visited, um, I wrote a final report. We provided the report on that community and then with the information also in compare to the rest of the state. Um, and that, was, that report we gave to the library directors and we also sent copies to the mayors of each community so that the mayor, again, kind of had that sense of libraries are important, libraries are vibrant, things are happening in libraries. I mean, that's always such, such, such an important thing and I think small libraries have that easier and harder in some ways both than, uh, than the larger libraries. Easier because you probably know your mayor, I mean you probably are, you know, you're acquainted, you've been around each other, it's easy to bump into each other, uh, that kind of access can be very, very useful, very valuable. Um, harder in that you know your mayor. <laughs> you guys have easy access to each other and um, I know I've been in situations and helped work with librarians and other in situations where that was not a good thing, uh, where maybe you know the it was a very strained relationship and uh, that makes it harder that we're around each other. Uh, if you had a little more distance it might be better. But regardless, uh, I'm very interested always in the idea of advocacy. So I always want to do these studies and find out this information for librarians, not just because it's fun and not just because it's interesting and not just because we might change a couple of things that we do, but really because I want us to be reaching out and I want us to be, you know, talking to other people. Everywhere I travel around the country a lot and I visit a lot of libraries and I very truthfully I'm stunned, constantly stunned by how great libraries are. Even, I mean, the very smallest libraries I've been to, the very smallest communities um, where it's one person who volunteers three hours a day, three days a week and that's the library. Still, they're doing just really neat, amazing things and I want to make sure that we're telling other people how neat, amazing and wonderful we are. So using a Q method is a way to not only have fantastic data that you can take out and you can share and give to other people, but also to help just you sort of connect with the people in your community and say, oh yeah, did you remember? We do this, we do this, we do this. We are just this awesome. You should come see us. So this is obviously just sort of a quick overview of some work that I've done with Q, some potential work that you might want to do with Q. Um, and a quick overview is not not necessarily enough here to kind of get you started and help you to feel comfortable. So the blurry book over here on the right, um, I'm pointing at the green one, it says Q methodology and I actually have a copy of the book right here in my hand too. This is written by Bruce McKeon and, excuse me, Dan Thomas. And so it's part of a series called Quantitative Applications in the Social Sciences. Um, they're, this is book number 66, there are a whole bunch of these little green books um, and they're nice, they're very useful. Um, they're from SAGE um, and they're 
they're good. I find this a little complicated, and until now, though, it's really been, until recently, it's been the book, though, that everybody used. So uh, last year, the, this book on the left, Doing Q Methodological Resource, Research, rather, came out. And so I'm actually still waiting for my copy to be delivered. Um, Amazon had a big run on them. But uh, this just looks fantastic. And so I've looked through it, and it looks very good, very useful. And I think it will help to sort of break the process down a little bit more so that you do feel comfortable. You do feel like, even if you don't have a really intense statistical background, even if you don't have a statistical background, <laughs> um, I really have almost no math skills. Uh, don't. Don't tell everybody else that. I'll, I'll be embarrassed. But uh, I, my math is terrible, and I can do Q method. It's, it's something that's very doable, and so it's something I think that can really be very useful to us. So this is the website that I mentioned earlier called QMethod.org. So this is where the Q community hangs out. This is where everybody gets together. Uh, people in a lot of disciplines come there. They, all their papers are put up there. Uh, different software that people are building to help interpret your Q data are there. Uh, there's a good listserv where people are talking about things. Um, sometimes they're talking about stuff that's really complicated and I, I don't understand it. But often though they're asking questions and they're bringing up ideas of things that, that were really useful to me. So these are the places that I would start. Uh, for you as you're thinking about ways that you could evaluate, ways that you can look at your community, and ways that you can bring in these new ideas to, to your library. And definitely, one of those should be me. Um, not, not to push myself on you, but I really enjoy working with um, the libraries to help set these kinds of things up. So I said at the beginning of this discussion, I was a public library director. Um, I, it was my first job out of library school, and when I talk about this, I often say to my students, I had no idea what I was doing. I really, I was so lost, and I was so confused, and I wanted to be better, and I wanted to do better. And I was really fortunate that I was in a good place, um, that I got a lot of training, uh, that, and that the people who were, uh, uh, excuse me, the people who were around me in my system, in my state, uh, people that I knew from other places, were supportive and were helpful, and that that really helped to get me through. So when I entered the academic side of the profession, though, I did this with kind of the thinking that I'm here to be the person who does the academic stuff, who does the researchy stuff in public libraries specifically. This is my area. This is what I spend all my time talking about. Um, so that people who are doing the hard work of public libraries, they don't have time, but I do. So we can partner together and we can work together. So it's kind of a long way of saying, I'm here. Uh, this is my email address, but you can always find me at Simmons College. And again, um, my slides and everything will be at the on this conference, and I'll be really happy to talk with you, uh, whether you're hearing this live or whether you're hearing this tape later. If you want to set up a Q project or any sort of project, really, but I'm specifically interested in Q today. Uh, I'm really happy to talk with you and help work with you. OK, so that is all that I had to say. And I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, all right, so that, you thanks, Gary. Yeah, at we, this we, time, we, if you want to go ahead and start trying to type in. Yep, uh, we will uh, happily take questions uh, for Mary viewing the Q&A. Uh, we already have got some queued up, but uh, please feel free to submit more. We'll get to as many as we can. And we have been recording this, and we'll be posting everything post. Uh, Laura, so we have some uh, questions from the audience. OK, we have one. Is there a difference between asking people to sort cards and just asking them to rank a list? Huh. Um, I'm going to loosely say no, and thinking that I understand exactly what you're saying, the idea is just that they're going to rank an idea. So they're sorting, sorting, ranking. The sorting goes, number one is my very best, most favorite. Number two is slightly less most favorite than number yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, same thing. Um, another question, have you done a study looking at the difference in perception of library needs between users, non-users, and uh, staff, boards, friends? 
that was actually something that, and that was beyond kind of the scope of what we're talking about today. It was something that we did try to break out of this study. So I did also then um, not do a queue, but I surveyed all the library staff across Illinois, and then I also surveyed directors across the country to sort of compare from what the patrons said they wanted to what the library staff said that they wanted or that they and that they felt comfortable doing now, and then what library directors across the country thought libraries kind of should be doing in general. Um, they weren't the answers there weren't wildly different. Uh, I think the patrons wanted more kind of hands-on thing, and the library people seem to be a little bit more interested in providing uh, better materials. But again, this is a study that was a few, uh, five or six years old now, so I think it may be different by now. I think we may all be thinking more along the lines of service. Okay. Um, another question, can you include blank cards for the patron or user to fill out to add to the stack? No, and that's, that's a question, and I should have thought to say that. Um, no, you can't, because you need to sort what you have there. So what I do, and I always do this, and I did in this study, is on their worksheet, I say, what else do you like? Um, so for example, one thing that none of us thought of, and I, I cannot imagine what we were doing, but when we put our cards together, no one thought about including homeschool services. And so several homeschool parents were part of our study. And I had one woman who wrote, the, she covered the entire front of the worksheet, the back of the sheet, and I gave her two more pieces of paper. Um, and she had so many ideas to share. So that's you bring in other ideas. But in just your sort, you need to identify and define every card. OK. OK, we have several questions. And I'm going to try to kind of put them all together in one. The essence of it seems to be how do you find the people out in the community or the people who don't come into the library to query them? How do you get people to participate? Sure. Oh, and this is always the challenging thing. Um, so this is the thing that I will say in my study, I don't think we did as well as I had planned it to happen. What I am planning now now that I'm more experienced in Q and know more about what I'm doing, is actually trying to contact community organizations. Um, so try to contact like the Lions, um, contact a Spanish center that you might have in your community. Um, different organizations where I know people will be and ask them if I could come there and do some of these studies with their people who may not be library, or I'm sorry, may not be library users. <laughs> um, other things that I have seen people do, and I think this would actually be great, and this would again be something that would be simpler in a smaller community than in a large urban area where people don't know you, is try to set up a desk at the hardware store on a Saturday and see if, you know, as people are coming out of the hardware store, could you take a few minutes? Um, we'll give you a library pencil if you fill out a Q study for us. It doesn't take very long to do this. It really, even sorting a bunch of cards only takes about 10 minutes. Um, so going to a hardware store, or going to a grocery store, someplace that's kind of outside your usual route. Um, and it's a little difficult. It's a little intimidating to go ask people. <laughs> but uh, most people are probably interested. OK. Um, we have a question. Have you tried an online version of this? I have. And again, if you go to thehumethod.org, they have online software that you can use. I again didn't just because I always try to keep everything as simple as it possibly as I possibly can so in fact the academic study that I showed you I did parallel studies and I did one online um, for academic librarians and then I did one where I traveled around to different academic libraries and actually visited them in person and the answers were just the same uh, the the same kind of groupings came up in both ways so I've done it um, and I it's it's fine it, it works great uh, I kind of like the hand-holding aspect. I kind of like being able to sit there with people because while they're sorting, you're chatting and you're talking about things. And they may just come up with other ideas that they just want to share. Or they may say, wow, yeah, I never thought of this. This is so cool. Uh, so I don't think there's a bad way to go, but just have a reason for why you're going online or in person. OK. And uh, final question, please. Um, what is the name of that software that analyzes the information? 
Um, sure. I think you gave the us one, a website before. Right. The one that I use is called, the software that I've been using is called PQ Method, letter P, letter Q, method, all one word. And it's on the Q Method website. It is clunky. It is a little difficult to use. And I think also on the webs on the Q Method website, there are other software programs that you can use that I think will probably be easier. I've just kind of stuck with this because it's the one that I started with and it's the one that I know. But you may want to start with another one. And so they'll be available on the Q website. What kind of cost is involved? Um, most of them are free. Uh, the one that I'm using, the PQ method, is completely free, <laughs> which is certainly an excellent price for a uh, poor academic. But um, the other ones, I I didn't buy this, but a friend of mine bought a, bought once a piece of software, and I think it was like $25. These are things that people are just kind of putting together themselves, so they're not... There, there is no large company that's making Q method software and charging you Microsoft level prices. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much, Mary. That is our time for this session of Big Talk from Small Libraries. We have been recording, and we will be uh, posting all the recordings and slides post-conference uh, starting next week. And Mary's email address there is uh, for you on the screen. If you have any additional questions, unfortunately, due to time, we can't get to everybody's questions. Uh, Mary, thank you once again for that. We really appreciate it and gave us a lot to think about.